I'm Dr. Beefy. Tell me about your name. The hottest girl in the school said like, oh, Topher, that's cute. And I went like, okay. And that was it. <laughs> we want you to come audition, bring your headshot and your resume. And I said, okay, I know what resume is, but what is a headshot? Spike saying something on a national level. I could be a part of helping him say that. How do you see this time we're in? I should say it's a great time to be white and male and shut up. I hope you tune in and check me out on the Carlos Watson show. It is as much fun to do as it looks. <laughs> the Carlos Watson show is brought to you by American Family Insurance. Hey family, it's Carlos Watson back with another great episode for you. Now today, killer episode headlined by an actor who found lasting fame thanks to his performance in the smash hit series, That 70s Show. Hopefully you remember it. He's since gone on to star in some of the coolest films around. You may remember him from Traffic, I love that, Interstellar, Spider-Man 3, and so many more. Currently, you can catch him starring in the brand new comedy series, Home Economics. Of course, I'm talking about my main man, Topher Grace. Hey, Topher. How you doing, man? How you doing? This is the one, Carlos. I've been waiting for this one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Are you in LA or where are you today? I'm in my, LA in my basement. This is the one area where my wife lets me put uh, some of my stuff. And uh, if I could show you the rest of the room, you'd, you'd realize what a mess it is. But it looks good there. Yeah, yeah, this is the one shot. So I've been doing all my COVID stuff from here. Please, everybody, say hello to Topher Grace. Please welcome Topher Grace. <laughs> In fact, this is a list of everything that I am going to take off your plate today. Because I can start by crossing off and do laundry. What are you doing about moving out? I don't know. How about Donna? I don't know. Your job? I don't know. Any reaction to any of this? Because now would be an excellent time. Tova, I have to ask you, tell me about your name. How important do you think your name has been to your success, because I feel like it is a distinctive name. Oh, I, I'm glad it helped. I think, I don't know if I ever thought about that, because it didn't change when I went into acting. My name's Christopher. I guess when I was at school at home, before I went to boarding school, my mom is a, a Patricia trapped in a pat. Okay, And okay. she kind of wished she'd gone by Patricia, so she kind of pushed that on me, like, you know, like, you should go by Christopher. Christopher Grace is a beautiful name, and I thought it was too. So people would say, like, you know, nice to meet you, and I'd say, hi, I'm Christopher, and they'd say, Nice to meet you, Chris. And I'd say, Topher. <laughs> and then when I went to boarding school, I was joking around about it. And I was in this circle of kids. I mean, this is like eighth grade. And the hottest girl in the school said like, oh, Topher, that's cute. And I went like, OK. And that was it. <laughs> Did I see something very cool that you've got lots of interesting Kevin Bacon acting connections with Kate Bosworth and Chloe Savigny? Oh, yeah. There was an acting program where you dump your kids and we all did a play during the summer. And there were so few people in this town that I'm from that were into uh, acting. All the weirdos all came together for this one program and then, you know, it's just a weird coincidence. Everyone has gone on to kind of work together. It's when you see those kind of blips and you see those kind of little circles of success. Is there anything else you think other than that that, that kind of had that many interesting people coming out of one spot? I think so. I mean, look, it's about as far as you can get from Hollywood, um, where we grew up, uh, distance-wise. Those, those are the people who really wanted it are the ones who kind of broke through. Topher, I love travel. Uh, it, it's been one of the, uh, my favorite things in this world. Where's the most beautiful place you've ever been? Uh, South Africa. I went with my family on a safari there. Something about... Uh, being out there, it's like, like you can feel it in your bones. It's like that's where man like started. Like you can just tell, you know? I think Cape Town's the most beautiful city I've ever seen anywhere. Where else would you go? I've yet to go to India. I would love to go there. My wife and I would love nothing more. I think we'll go to like Italy for two weeks or something. Uh, we went to St. Lucia on our honeymoon and it was, but the place is pretty fantastic. And you came out to LA for school? Was that, was that how you ended up in, in acting? So me telling my story of success is just, uh, you know, don't do it the way I did it. I just kind of stumbled into it. I, I kind of, I liked acting, but I didn't think it could be a job. And I didn't think I was like a cutie or anything. I was on the varsity tennis team and I had this injury and I thought, yeah, I'm gonna do the play. The girl who did the sets, her parents were big time Hollywood producers who I'd met who were lovely. And they said, hey, since you're going to USC next year, can we 
call you. And I didn't know what they meant. I mean, I thought maybe they meant to be like their assistant or something. So I went like, I mean, this is horrible. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, sure, babe, like Hollywood, like have your people call my people. Like we'll do lunch at Spago or whatever. I mean, I thought I was being funny. And she called me in my dorm and said, we're looking for kids who are not like the typical Hollywood kids. We want you to come audition, bring your headshot and your resume. And I said, okay, I know what resume is, but what is a headshot? She said, it's like uh, a picture of you. So we know what the resume, who the resume. I said, okay, cool. And I showed up and my resume was like Dunkin' Donuts and you know, a Suncoast video where I'd worked at the mall. Already like not the right resume for the room. And then I took out the picture and it was just me and my friends all at Six Flags. Like it was. Now I need you to sweep the garage, clean the leaves out of the gutters, pick up the dry cleaning and uh, fix that shelf in the pantry. I'll run that back. Okay. Fix the shelf, sweep the garage, pick up the leaves. Dry cleaning? Yeah. As you look back now that you've done so many movies, so many TV shows, why do you think you got it? Even though it's Hollywood and, and you have success by being different, a lot of people assimilate and do things a certain way. And, um, I didn't know any of those, any of those rules. And I, you know, I had to kind of make up my own rules. And that was the truth for a lot of people in that cast. Ashton had never acted before. Laura had never acted. Wilmer barely spoke English. It was like really brave of them to find people who had their own, they're marching their own drummer. It was actually a bumpy first couple of episodes, but then we all learned our own version of how we wanted to do it. And, uh, it was just a, it was a great, best experience of my life. Oh, you mean the one where the big red whore is sick of people keeping secrets? No, no, no. The one where the big red whore keeps sticking her big red nose in places where it doesn't belong. Hey, watch what you say about the big red whore. When did you know the show was going to be a hit? I did know at the beginning it was not working. There was a feeling of like, this isn't good enough and I'm not good enough. And, and it wasn't like how some people think that and they're wrong. Like, I really had to learn. Hey. I was just inside with mom and she's really upset, so I just want to know, what's your problem? You made me bald. <laughs> the best thing about a sitcom or a weekly show, but especially a sitcom because it's live and there's a live audience there giving you feedback. Yeah, maybe you're not good that week. You got to dust yourself off. Next week you do another one. So I was saying it's very brave of those producers, but they kind of said, oh, they'll get good eventually. And after about 20 episodes or so, yeah, we were really, we kind of figured it out. Oh no! What, what? <laughs> Just kidding. It's not funny, Donna. I can't even do it now. <laughs> and a lot of times though, networks aren't that patient. Um, or at least maybe that's just today. You're right. It, it wouldn't have worked if we hadn't been able to really have 20 different shots at it. And around, I remember around episode 13, we were like, oh, that's kind of what the show is. And everyone started to click. And I mean, look, at the time, it was just pure desperation. But then it started to kind of work. How did that, if at all, change family dynamics and friendship dynamics? They had a very healthy separate life in Connecticut where I grew up. And I don't know what how I would have done if I didn't have that home base. When things started to get crazy and the show started to get very popular and then I was doing movies and it was a heady time. I could always hop on a plane, go back. They still lived in my childhood home. I'd sleep in my bunk bed and my dad would make like pancakes on Sunday morning. You know, it was like, that's the way I was really spoiled is being born to those two people. Our home is the training ground for her dreams policy. Ensure carefully. Dream fearlessly. Where's your headspace been over the last over the last year or so? Well, first of all, just congratulations to you and oh, thank you. Uh, this show and uh, what you guys have meant to people over the last year too, and um, and having that conversation, thank you. which everyone needs to be a part of. Uh, I had a little bit of an early entry into that conversation before the pandemic, uh, doing Black Klansman. Hello, this is Ron Stallworth calling. Well, who am I speaking with? This is David Duke. I remember getting the call from Spike Lee and thinking, this probably won't have the level of success I wanted to, but I mean, Spike Lee, I mean, 
he's the guy to do it. And it's Spike saying something on a national level. But I could be a part of helping him say that. Why don't you come down to Louisiana sometime? See how we play. To me, it's, it's been a depressing time. And that movie sadly became more and more relevant as it went. But at least there was an artistic kind of cathartic uh, experience in being able to, to say something about it. How do you see this time we're in? I mean, it's funny. I've been saying to a lot of the folks I work with that I feel like the 2020s are going to be the new 60s. I think you're right. And this last year is like gasoline to that. When you saw the video, what did you think? That could be my father. That could be my brother. And everybody was engaged in a conversation. No one could hide from themselves because they were sitting at home. Yeah. Did you change at all any you feel like over the last last year? I think it's a great time to be white and shut up. <laughs> Just listen <laughs> to other people. I have been so educated and continue to be educated. And my wife is 10 years younger than me and has educated me a lot too. I should say it's a great time to be white and male and shut up. <laughs> Being 10 years uh, separated by age, has that had any interesting impact on the marriage or the dynamic? I think more in the sense that she has a different relationship with technology. I mean, we're not that far apart, but she has a different relationship with technology and how she gets her news. I mean, I'm like kind of still DVRing the news and she is telling me what she already knows from hours ago. I'm also an actor. Like, there's not a real reason for me to have technology, but, uh, Anyone who says they haven't been educated over the last year about anything is just just willfully ignorant. It's funny, I kind of look back on it. It's everyone's least favorite year, right? But I have a feeling we're gonna like look back at it years from now and go, wow, that like changed so much. Like, is it was it really bad? I think you were 100 percent and I appreciate all the nuance you're saying. Obviously, no one wanted anyone to to die, but I appreciate what you're saying and I think that's true because I think people had time to sit with themselves. I think people had time to learn about things. I think people had time to kind of ask themselves some fundamental questions about a relationship. I wonder whether people will close down in the near term here because I think what happened on January the 6th and Siobhan trial, I think is so, I don't know what the right word is, Topher, but maybe painful. Oh, I see what you're saying, like out of, uh being hurt, people will shut down a little bit, or they can't, they can't process. I actually wish my kids were a little bit older, because our oldest is three, and you know, we were watching The Verdict the other day, and I just, I wish she could be a part of it and understand. I mean, she'll know it in terms of history, but it's really another thing to sit there with your family and watch it, you know? Did you expect that he would be found guilty? Yeah, <laughs> but then, I guess expect, I wasn't sure, and I think that's why everyone was crowded around their TV set. I saw Stephen Colbert the other night say, like, this is like, you know, mopping up a spill on the Titanic. As Ben Crump, the Floyd family lawyer, reminded us today, justice for black America is justice for all America. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. It's a great way to say it. But I have very few moments in front of the TV like that. I'm always asking people about dreaming fearlessly. I feel like we're living again in such an interesting era. And on one hand, some people hesitate to dream fearlessly. Some people do dream fearlessly, but don't know how to bring it about. What, if anything, would you say to your younger self or just to other people about what you've learned about how to dream fearlessly and, and bring those dreams alive? I had a couple tough years where I was like kind of playing the wrong character or, you know, I'd play a bad guy and it wouldn't work or, it's just, it was just hard. I, I was in the wrong movie, but I look back and I don't fault myself for that period of time because by the end of it, I was playing David Duke in a like Academy Award right, film. Right, right. And I looked at myself and went, I think now I can go back and do like an ABC show. <laughs> like, I've got as far as you can humanly get from, from what I had originally done. I wanted to do it all. I just wanted to be in small films and blockbusters and really challenge myself and and learn stuff, so, but I'm so glad that I did it. Try lots of different things, especially if you've had success with something, you should do something that is the opposite. This is the story of the Hayworth family. Three siblings who loved each other, but money sometimes got in the way. Topher, tell me about this new TV series. Was this your idea? Were you brought into this project? I was brought into it. Mike Colton and John Abood are the a writing team, and this is actually based on Mike Colton's life. He has this experience in the Bay Area. His brother is in the 1% of the 1%. His sister is really 
struggling to get by. And he was, at the time they wrote it, they were unemployed. And he went to have like one more kid. That's what he could afford with his wife. And they accidentally had twins. And it put him just firmly kind of in the middle. When I read it, I thought, oh, what an interesting idea. But I didn't know it was based on reality. No, 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 no. Look, <clears throat> I know everyone thinks that my career is thriving. But the truth. <laughs> Tom. I'm good. I'm good. Do you act differently today? Like literally the craft of acting, do you act differently in any meaningful way than you did five years ago, 10 years ago? The answer is I did a play in New York eight years ago. And there is like before I did that play and after. And I'd always heard beforehand actors say, it's not until you've done like, something on the stage. And I, thought, oh, I was in plays in high school. Like what's a big difference? And, even 70s show, we had an audience. I thought, ah, it's no big deal. But it was doing a real professional play and the rehearsal period. We rehearsed for four weeks. To sit somewhere for four weeks and think about every line of the show and then to do it 200, 300 times in a row. How do you spend your time? What do you love to do when you're not acting? Well, now that we have kids, the answer is I'm probably going down like a YouTube hole. My big hobby before we were doing all this was, uh, I like to edit, which is weird because it's within the same industry that I work, but it really has nothing to do with my job. I got an Avid editing machine on eBay and I started trying to figure out how to use it at home. And it became like, you know, woodworking in the garage. Like I just go in and kind of cut things together and see how it worked. And it still fascinates me. All right, I'm gonna do a little rapid fire with you if you don't mind. Please. Who's your favorite actor? I think Tom Hanks is just amazing. And I kind of, I, I thought Jimmy Stewart was an amazing actor growing up, really loved him. What's your favorite performance that you've ever had? For me, it's probably this film I did called In Good Company. What kind of experience do you have in ad sales? Uh, well, I'll be honest with you, Dan, not much. How much? Um, none. None. The cast was amazing and the script was amazing. Topher, who are your closest friends? Look, this might sound a little cliche, but I am really glad that I married my best friend. Topher, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Really a pleasure, dude. Okay, be Bye, well, sir. be safe. Topher Grace. Yes, what'd you think? I really enjoyed him. I went home and watched the show. Uh, oh. Yeah, his, his new show, Home Economics. It's a solid show. I can't believe it's been that long since that show's been around. Isn't that crazy? He's aged amazingly. I remember thinking that he reminded me of Phineas a lot. Oh, I take that. I Just take the that. way that he talked. Yeah. He was funny, he was humble, and he was really smart too. I remember doing, um, thinking that. And I think Phineas talks a lot about how he kind of stumbled into music and he just kind of got famous out of nowhere and Topher talked about that too where he kind of just stumbled into acting and now they're both really big. Hey, I hope you enjoyed Topher Grace. What a good dude. Really enjoyed his story. Very humble. Love his parents and really appreciate that he had that kind of good support. What a wild story about how he broke into it. And I love that he realized how special it was and really kind of doubled down. Good for him. Also seems like he's gotten very lucky in the marriage category. Good stuff that way too. All right, listen, thanks for watching the show. You know what to do. Like, subscribe, and listen. And join us next time right here on The Carlos Watson Show. Adios.